Hello, I'm Leo Duca. I'm presenting here the work of the PQ Crypto Conference 2002. And this work is about some neglected cost inside um, attacks against lattice crypto systems, more specifically some overhead inside the BDGL lattice ceiling algorithm. So let me start by introducing you uh, lattice ceiling. Lattice ceiling is a core algorithm for lattice cryptanalysis. It is currently the fastest known algorithm for finding the shortest vector problem, SVP. And it is rarely used on the whole lattice. It is more generally used inside BKZ algorithm, where it is called inside lattices of smaller uh, dimensions called blocks. Um, the central task of this algorithm is given a very large and exponentially large uh, list of points. Uh, that we're going to model as being uniform of, uh, on the sphere. The goal is to find all the close by pair in this list, namely finding all the vectors at angle less than 60 degrees or inner product less than one half. And doing so naively leads to a quadratic algorithm, but in techniques that have been introduced, imported in cryptanalysis by Thijs Laarhoven allows to decrease this quadratic complexity to something subquadratic. In particular, the BDGL algorithm, which is the fastest asymptotic algorithm, which this complexity due to the 0.292D, and then some sub-exponential factors. And the context uh, of this talk is a dive into those small O's. In particular, if we want concrete security estimation more than asymptotics, for example, for the standardization, then we need to look at the exact cost, not just, not just the asymptotic cost. This has, uh, of course, already been done uh, by a work of 2020, and it replaced Asymptotic formulas by exact formulas, it costed carefully each uh, elementary steps in terms of number of gates, and this was then used by various NIST candidates to give uh, more precise estimates. However, uh, it remains uh, some inaccuracies in those estimates. For example, recently shown by Metsoft, there has been some steps of PTGL that had been uh, overcosted. Uh, but here in this talk, I want to focus on another uh, inaccuracy, most uh, more precisely the fact that some least decodable code and their quality has been uh, idealized for the analysis. And I want to look at uh, how much the real uh, least decodable code differ from this idealized version and how much we lose on efficiency because of this uh, non-ideal behavior. This was mentioned already in the Kyber specification as a question, as question two uh, in section 5.3. And there are other inaccuracies uh, mentioned in this section of the Kyber specs. Uh, however, I uh, will not discuss them today. Uh, today, I provide you a solution with Q2. I don't have a solution yet for the other inaccuracies. Um, so let me uh, come back to the sieving algorithm. Here is a naive search for a close by pair. We take the points one at a time and we compute the distances to all the other points and we check whether each of these distance is small. And we repeat this for each point and uh, until we visited them all, we've now considered uh, a quadratic number of uh, points, uh, of pairs of points and computed their distance. So the BDGL lattice sieving algorithm is uh, like other uh, many other papers at that period that tries to tackle this quadratic factor. And it does so like all those other papers by resorting to locality sensitive hashing or more precisely here locality sensitive filtering where the strategy consists of constructing local buckets and only search within those buckets. So here we've, for example, constructed two blue buckets, the blue regions. And instead of looking for all pairs, we only look at pairs inside those buckets. And for example, the pair 0, V0 and V9, they're closed and luckily they they fall in the same bucket. So it is going to be detected. But the pair V1 and V2 
uh, we've been less lucky. It was uh, it crosses the border of the bucket, so so we're missing this one. And uh, because because of this, there there are going to be a lot of possible variants depending on the shapes of those buckets and the size of those buckets, which are going to lead to a different time memory and success trade off. And if you're missing pairs with certain probabilities, and you have to repeat the algorithm many times to compensate for that. Um, so the specific way that BDGL goes about it is that it consider filters that are spherical caps and uh, idealize a little bit those filters by assuming the, the two following properties. First, those centers, the, filter, the centers of those filters are efficiently least decodable. Meaning that if you're given an arbitrary point on the sphere, you can find all the filters that this point passes through in uh, effic efficiently, meaning essentially proportional to the number of solution, not proportional to the number of filters that exist. And for the analysis, uh, for the synthetic analysis, it is also assumed that the centers of those filters are uniform and independent over the sphere. And under those hypotheses, you conclude on a complexity of square root of three halves to the n plus some sub-exponential factors. However, uh, it is quite obvious that requirement two and three are kind of incompatible. If you want the centers to be least decodable, you're going to need them to be some, somewhat structured. And if they're somewhat structures, then they cannot be perfectly independent. And this is this lack of independence that we're about to study. So what is the specific instantiation proposed in BDGL? Well, those are not so far from random codes. Instead of taking a random code in the full dimension, we're going to construct the random codes on sub-dimension. So k uh, random subcodes in dimension n over k. And we're going to take the direct products of all those sets. And with this structure, it is pretty nice. You can do least decoding with a small overhead. Uh, in particular, um, so we, the, you're first going to have to pay essentially for the size of the subcodes, not the size of the whole code. And then you're going to pay for each of the passing filters. So this is a behavior you want to see. And if this number of passing filter overwhelm these quantities and you're in the golden regime where essentially there is no cost overhead for this decoding. Uh, even if this number is not negligible, this, if you take k slightly larger than constant, this overhead is going to be sub exponential. So you might also want to tolerate this. So here's already a place for trade-off. Um, however, there's another overhead uh, by this construction that is uh, described in this theorem 5.1, which is a probabilistic overhead, which is specifically the loss that is related to the lack of independence of your spherical code. Most precisely, it is proven that if you take k equal log n or big O of log n, then the success probability loss compared to the idealized uh, case, namely the case where f would be perfectly random is at most sub-exponential, two to the tilde of squared n. So this work is basically about con um, con concrete estimation of this factor. And how, how to go about it? Well, ideally, you would like an analytic approach. Like you could look at the this asymptotic proof from BDGL and try to see if you can make it uh, concrete. However, this, this proof is highly not tight. And uh, if you want to make it tight and give estimation results and upper bounds, it becomes it becomes a mess. Honestly, I have no clue on how to approach this. Uh, another approach would be to, to just run the algorithm in C and maybe extrapolate from uh, small dimensional data. But if you don't even know the, the shape of the asymptotics, only an upper bound on this shape, then it is not clear how you want to fit uh, your data before extrapolating it. So this is a risky business. What we propose in this work is to still 
make an experimental approach, but instead of experimenting with the whole algorithm, we're going to do experiments that are specifically focused on those random product codes to estimate precisely this probability in a way that is sufficiently fast for experimenting directly in the dimensions of interest. Um, and there's a nice way to do this that I'm going to describe in the next slides, but we also propose two technical contributions to significantly accelerate uh, our experiments. And uh, from there, we're going to reach some concrete results. For example, we were able to uh, do uh, this estimation and parameter exploration in dimension uh, around 380, which is roughly NIST level one uh, kind of uh, hardness. And for there, we conclude that for the same memory uh, than, than the idealized case, then the actual cost is two to the six uh, times more than previously uh, estimated. Uh, it is also possible to, to decrease the, this extra time uh, by doing it, playing with the time memory trade-off, but this is actually very costly and you're gonna save only a small amount of time for a lot of memory. And you're not even gonna be able to eliminate the full uh, time overhead. Um, so let's recap what we want to measure experimentally. That's the following. You consider a random close pair V and W and a random product code F. And um, you want to see what is the probability that the code is going to detect the close pair F and W, meaning what is the probability that there is an element in this code that, that is close to both V and W. So the naive solution given that this is a least decodable code would be the following, sample the pair, sample the code, list the code around each point of the pair V and W and check whether those two sets of uh, code words do intersect. Um, this is already somewhat faster than running the algorithm, the full algorithm itself, because here we're doing the experiment for a known close pair V and W, whereas when we're running the algorithm, we're searching for those close pair. Uh, however, there are further way of accelerating this process because here it's still going to be quite slow, exponentially slow in fact. So here are the technical contribution of the paper. The first one is the following. So again, we have two points V and W and we're wondering whether um, there is a point F that falls inside, uh, that falls close to both of them. So whether there's a point that falls inside this intersection of two balls. And one way of accelerating uh, this experiment is to note that this intersection of two balls fits inside an even smaller ball. So instead of uh, least decoding around both V and W and then checking the intersection, we can least decode around the midpoint and here, this, this decoding is going to happen with a smaller radius. And already, this is going to accelerate the decoding quite significantly. At least it's not in the regime. So. And then you want to check, because you've, you've list decoded in a slightly richer region than the a region of interest. In that list, you're still going to have to check that they are actually fall in the intersection of interest. Uh, but this is already uh, quite a nice speed up. For the second speed up, uh, let me first about let me first tell you why it is slow. So again, we're uh, we're considering the following thing: we have two points V and W, and for each code word, we're considering the events that uh, W and V pass both filters, meaning that uh, F is close to both V and W. And I'm going to call this event EF. And we're not so much interested in the probability of each of those events. Actually, we know the probability of each of those events. But we're interested in the probability that at least one such event happens. So the union of all those events. And those events are not independent. So, and this is precisely what we're trying to, to capture you know, how much is lost on the union of those events because they're not independent. And the thing is that in certain regimes, 
uh, of interest, in particular the small memory regime, even asymptotically, uh, this success probability S that we want to measure is already exponentially small. Uh, so if we want to, to have a good estimate of it, we're going to need exponentially many samples. Basically, we have a needle in a haystack problem. Um, so here is a, a better way of estimating this lack of independence without you know, randomly shooting in the dark. Uh, that is, we want to focus on successes. Really, the, the issue that we're trying to, to, to measure, to capture, is that the, the successes will tend to come in packets. Sometimes, whenever there is one uh, event that triggers, a lot of other events are triggered. And this is the bad situation. And we want to measure how bad it is. So we want to focus on successes. And the way we can do this is by doing a conditional experiment. So we're first going to choose the random product codes. And we're going to choose one code word in particular in that, uh, in that code that's associated with one such event. And we're going to sample the pair V and W uh, itself condition on that particular event. And then we're going to measure how many events are triggered by this specific pair and this specific F. So this number is at least one because by design we've chosen a particular f for which the event uh, holds, but it can be more than one. For example, if you look at, let's assume that we've selected event E1, there is a fair probability that at least E9 or E6 is also triggered and maybe both. So here I is going to be one, two, or three. And here I'm going to propose you a lemma that uh, allow you to measure what we're interested as the expectation of the reciprocal of i. In particular, the probability that one of those events trigger divided by the sum of the individual probability is the expectation of one over i. So I'm not going to uh, detail you the proof of, of this lemma here. Uh, I can, you can refer to the paper, or you can have fun thinking about it by yourself. I advise for the second. Uh, but the, the key point I want to make here is that if you do these experiments, you're going to converge much more quickly to the right estimation for uh, measuring this, this probability that you're interested in. Um, so that's it for the technical contribution. Now let me quickly uh, reach the, the conclusion. Um, so here is the plot uh, for dimension 384. The origin of this plot is the idealized estimation made in previous papers. So namely, uh, this would cost about 2 to the 98 uh, bits of memory and 2, and two to the 134 uh, gates. And it turns out that for the same memory, you need six more, uh, six more bits of uh, 2 to the 6 more gates to actually solve it. And you can play with the time memory trade-off. But again, in the time memory metric, this, uh, this is going to cost uh, six more bits than previously uh, estimated. So there is one caveat to uh, this uh, conclusion, is that this is a conclusion about a subroutine of the algorithm or of the old attack. This is about the specific subroutine in one particular dimension, the subroutine of finding all pairs. In, when, you, when you do full attacks, you're going to run these algorithms in many blocks of different sizes. And in smaller block sizes, you can play with the time memory trade-off and spend a bit more memory than in the largest block size. Basically, you're abusing the fact that the total cost in time is the sum of individual time cost, whereas the total cost in memory is the maximum of all the memories, at least if you run things sequentially. And uh, because of this, you can mitigate a little bit uh, the, the factor. So for example, if, if you want to run uh, at this 2 to the 98 memory, you might save back about one bit on time. 
this is not big, but you know, this is a matter of not letting any stone unturned. Um, some closing remarks. So uh, does this all mean that we can conclude uh, five more bits of security for NIST level one schemes based on lattices? Uh, no, for two reasons. So first is it depends on your memory cost model. Um, and some people consider that memory does not cost anything, or at least the RAM model considers this. I don't know if anyone really believes this model is realistic, but it is used. Uh, and in that case, well, you can go down to a huge amount of memory and only increase the time cost by a factor two and, or two and a half. Well, if you look at the memory requirement, this is pretty big. At one petabyte per square meter, you're basically filling Jupiter or maybe Earth if you're more reasonable. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the RAM estimate. Uh, furthermore, if you look at more advanced attacks, you have more room to play with different time memory trade-offs at various places of the algorithm and you might want to, to do a little bit little less sieving and a little bit more of something else so you might be able to uh, uh, mitigate just a little bit more uh, this overhead um, however one annoying thing is that this analysis is a bit hard to systematize so here i've given you uh, you know, in one specific dimension, and just getting all those curves cost me 40 core days. Admittedly, this is a Python program. It abused NumPy quite a bit, but there's still a subroutine that is, you know, an accelerated Python, and it's a recursive function. So I, I'm sure if you implement it, it can be much faster. But this is not exactly the kind of uh, estimation techniques that you want to use in an estimator. So it would be much nicer if we could get an analytic uh, estimate for, for those things, especially if you want to play with the time memory trade-off. Um, and uh, at last, I would like to mention I, what I think is a beautiful open question, because in BDGL instantiation, we refuse those random product codes which is a bit of a brutal solution to the question. You know, we're, we're trying to find uh, something that is least decodable and we end up doing random codes, just smaller dimensions. It's, it's natural, but it's a bit sad, especially that they're, given that they're a huge coding literature, deal with spherical codes, least decodable codes. So is there anything in this literature that would be more fitting for BTGL? Uh, so that probably wouldn't give a asymptotic speed up. I think here you would only be playing with the with the sub exponential factors, but maybe there is something better to be done. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, it's great that this conference is online, but I would also be happy to see you at the next uh, physical conference. Bye.